everybody are very welcome to introduction to IFRS 17. This is for life actuaries and non-life actuaries. Uh, my name is Mike Claffey, I'm chair of the Life Committee, and my role is to introduce people and help on the Q&A at the end. Um, so you're all very welcome. This is the largest ever booking to a lunchtime meeting, so congratulations. Uh, the second thing to be proud of is that this is being recorded as a podcast, as we often do, but in fact, we're also experimenting with this being a Web. webinar. We're being streamed as well, so uh, there's two bits of technology getting tested today, so you can always say you were here on that day. Um, I have to introduce two speakers. Uh, we have Niall Norton here from PwC, and he's going to give insight into the life aspects of IFRS 17. Um, Niall's been with PwC for a long time, 15 years, very involved in actuarial consulting, but also IFRS 17. And is joined then with Joanne Lonergan, who's here from Deloitte. Um, Joanne is very involved in IFRS 17 in Deloitte, has been working on a lot of projects, involved in the F4G, more details later. Um, and both are involved in working parties of the Society of Actuaries on IFRS 17. Just as a short intro, uh, this is a timely meeting. IFRS 17 was actually introduced in May 2017. The standard was published in 2017, so quite a while ago now. But its implementation date is 1st of January 2021. And that's why now it's so topical. It is as lots of insurance companies across the world get to grips with IFRS 17, and definitely here in Europe and here in Ireland, uh, it's being accelerated quite a bit. Um, so the format of today is Niall will go first for just under half an hour of content, and uh, Joanne will then follow with about a half an hour of content as well from, from the non-life side, and then we'll take Q&A after that, if that's okay. In terms of CPD watchers, we're going to finish at two. Um, I think there's a chance we finish at five to two. There's no chance we finish at half one. So you're going to get 90 minutes of CPD. Uh, um, and the other thing um, for people attending is CPD is a recorded event. I will send around the sign-in sheet. If you don't sign this, you weren't here. I'm very sorry. So make sure you find this sheet and sign in. And with that, I'll hand over to Niall. Thank you. Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon all. So this is an introduction to IFRS 17. Uh, so it will be somewhat high level. Uh, we will be touching on lots of different areas, uh, but we are keeping the slides. The slides will be uh, available online as usual hereafter. And that means we've included quite a bit of content for reference that we won't be uh, spending too long on. And that may help if you see it on small print, you won't need to worry, you don't need to read it today, you can read it another day. And the first bit of small print is that there's lots of interpretation in IFRS 17, so the views are neither those of the society nor necessarily of those of our employers. So what are we going to talk to? Give a little bit of background and overview, touch on classification and bundling. Uh, those existed, exist under IFRS 4, but those uh, have been changed a little bit under IFRS 17. Aggregation level or unit of account, to use the terminology, uh, is a big consideration. It's how much detail, how granular you go into for IFRS 17. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll hand over to Joanne then, who will talk to one of the key fun areas of actuarial for measurement models and the different measurement model, models that apply. Transition is applying IFR 17 to your enforced portfolio. So it's a retrospective standard. You have to apply it as if you were always applying it. That's a big deal for longer term business. Presentation and disclosures, We'll touch on that and we'll see that actually it's very different. Uh, presentation is very different. It's much more on a, a revenue earned basis as, as opposed to having premium in our rep income statement anymore. Disclosures have changed a lot. But of course, it's not even those areas, those are some of the headings that we see in the standard, but it's actually much wider ranging impacts. Uh, it's not just accounting and actuarial, and we'll be saying that a few times probably. Uh, it's a broad impact operationally, but also commercially. And we'll touch on a few little example steps uh, that you might, uh, companies are looking at in advance to get through their implementation project to IFRS 17 and then wrap up with some key thoughts. So, abbreviations for reference. So, let's start. So, this is a very much a standard slide uh, with background to the standard. The standard has been in development for 20 plus years. We have the interim standard of IFRS 4. Can I ask, maybe by a show of hands, who is familiar with IFRS 4? Okay, I'll give a bit of background on IFRS 4 in due course then. Um, so IFRS 4 was very much, uh, was intended to be an insurance contract accounting standard with so much debate and controversy over how a, a global insurance accounting 
contract standard could be developed. It didn't arrive in time. So we had uh, what IFRS 4 came in 1 January 2005 for EU listed companies and in, in many other territories adopted it as well. But ultimately, it was continue as you're doing for insurance classified contracts. However, split your business between investment classified as defined under the standard and insurance classified. And investment then fell under other accounting standards, being IS39 and IS18 at the time. Since then, they said, okay, we'll come back and we'll actually develop a full accounting standard. So that's taken a lot longer than planned. And as Mike said, May last year, the final standard was issued. But is it really final? Uh, there's a lot of debate still ongoing. Uh, it's, the effective date is planned to be 1 January 2021. But uh, there is potential for deferral. Uh, there may be no deferral. There may be one year, maybe two years to be determined. Ultimately, endorsement by the Commission, the European Commission, was due ne uh, next year. Uh, that normally we would expect might take a couple of years because uh, IFRS 9 took a couple of years for endorsement. But EFRAG, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group that advises the European Parliament on endorsement, uh, it was due to give advice in December, and that seems unlikely to happen. They've raised six controversial areas or six areas that they believe more work needs to be done on. And uh, they've written to the ISB, that's the International Accounting Standards Board, who developed these standards. Uh, industry is very much excited about a number of areas as well. A collection of global European, um, sorry, global insurance industry bodies, including uh, Insurance Europe, uh, have written to the ISB just recently and uh, asked again for a two year delay and potential changes. But the ISB is not inclined to rush uh, to that. In fact, uh, reg solvency regulators, which you would think may not have that much interest in IFRS reporting, have written to the ISB saying, don't delay uh, and uh, please keep going. So lots to play for. Uh, something to keep under view. Ultimately, uh, companies would like, some would like, it depends where people are at in their projects, some would like a delay, and so they can need, they need the time they feel, or they can refine their projects or potentially move beyond compliance to uh, value add from the project. Others are, uh, group, some groups are quite far advanced and would feel that actually they'd rather just finish it off. And so it varies significantly. I'm going to touch just very briefly, IFRS 9 is the replacement for IS39. It, became effective 1 January this year, unless you're an insurer that took uh, the exemption where you were eligible for it. So this is the standard that deals with financial asset side of the balance sheet. The thing to be aware of there is that uh, if you're an insurer, uh, you either say, I've taken the exemption and make no disclosure this year end about it, or you adopt it and you see does it change the valuation of your assets, and of course you have extra disclosures as a result of IFRS 15 uh, is um, the replacement for IS-18 and deals with revenue recognition. So this is more for investment classified contracts, uh, which is mainly for life insurers. So that became effective 1 January 18. So I'm just mentioning that for reference. And we think about what the standard is in scope of, it's what's classified as insurance or reinsurance under the definition in the standard. So for non-life insurers, nearly everything, if not everything, uh, gets into that category. Uh, often for the majority of reinsurance as well, but for a lot of light companies, it can be all in one, all in the other, or quite a mix. Investment contracts that are pure investments have no significant insurance risk transfer and also have no discretionary participation features, which are effectively things like with profits. Continue as you're doing. They fall under IS39, IS, IFRS 9, etc. No change there. But if you're in the other category, and we'll come on to that, this is where the fun is, IFRS 17. I just, very lastly, I mentioned, this is meant to be a global insurance accounting standard. There was a convergent attempt with the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the US. Um, that project uh, effectively died in 2014 when um, FASB looked to make some uh, targeted improvements, but there, was, there isn't going to be a global convergent standard. Okay, so why IFR 17? I won't go through all of this, but ultimately it's to harmonize or at least make more comparable insurance companies, insurance accounts. At the moment, you can have uh, divergent accounting policies, not only across groups, but even within a group at a local subsidiary level, you can have different, whether you're doing Irish GAP, uh, French GAP, or if you're an Irish company, existing accounting policies can mean different things. It could mean something based on a Psalm C1 set of reserves with a DAC, it could mean US GAP, it could mean Canadian IFRS, it could mean modified Psalm C2. There's quite a lot of flexibility there. IFRS 17 is meant to harmonize that and bring consistent accounting and make everything more comparable. That's the theory. So what's the scope? It will replace IFRS 4. 
So if you're an IFRS reporter, or if you're an FRS 101 reporter, you're in scope of IFRS 17. If you're FRS 102, 103 uh, for your local financial statements, uh, then you'll have to wait quite a bit longer potentially for when they may converge. Nothing set as yet there. As Mike said, uh, 1 January 2021 is the effective date, assuming no delay. Prior comparators are required. So we're talking about, first of all, starts at 1 January 21. So assuming in December year end, you're talking about year end 21 being your first full set of financial statements. Then you need an opening position, so that's year end 20. Then you need a prior comparative, so that's, uh, you'll need opening for year end 20, which is year end 19. And that's assuming you take the, take the exemption to avoid further year comparatives. And of course, it's fully retrospective application. So it's not just changes for your new business or, or a subset. If you're writing multi-year business, uh, on non-life or long-term long life business, you're going to have significant exercise around transition. And we'll come back to that later. Okay. So at a very simplistic level, how does it compare to IFRS 4 and, and SOMC 2? So on the left-hand side, we have uh, one example of what companies might do under uh, IFRS 4, where they can continue to use existing accounting policies for insurance classified contracts, or reinsurance classified for that matter. They might have a prudent reserve, but then they might hold a deferred acquisition cost asset. And so when you net the two off, effectively, you're holding a smaller amount. SOMC 2, uh, as we're all hopefully familiar with, you'll have your SOMC 2 definition of a best estimate liability and a risk margin. While for IFRS 17, something quite different, and Joanne will go into a bit more detail on this, but one of the methods, the building block approach, uh, or variable fee approach, you'll have an IFRS 17 best estimate liability, a risk adjustment, which may be different to your risk margin, likely to be, uh, and a contractual service margin, which is a completely new concept, uh, which is meant to be deferral of upfront uh, profits. So what we can see is, yes, there are some similarities between SOMC2 and IFR 70 at this very, very high level, but when we get into it, there are significant differences, potentially differences between the best estimate liabilities, uh, likely some differences between the risk margin, risk adjustment, and contractual service margin to completely different thing altogether. And that's just measurement on one particular approach, never mind presentation, disclosure, and all the rest. So when you, the first thing, of course, is uh, what drives accounting is classification. And so on drive first four, companies were obliged to classify between insurance and investment and consider uh, for life companies, really, if they had discretionary participation features, what that meant. Overall, the scope is still the same. If it's classified as insurance or reinsurance, whether it's inwards or outwards, uh, or if it's classified as investment, discretionary participation features, so I'm talking monetizing profit here, uh, which is for life companies, then you're under the standard. So that's not a change compared to IFRS 4 by itself, other than in the rare situation where you're only writing that last category of investment with DPF, discretionary participation features, then if you don't have any insurance classified, you're actually not in the standard. But that's not expected to happen for too many companies. What I really wanted to highlight in this slide is that there's been a modification to the definition of significant insurance risk transfer. So many companies did their exercise um, of IFRS classification on first-time adoption, then they look at their new contracts thereafter and maybe don't worry too much about the past. And in theory, once insurance, always insurance. Um, and investment contracts could potentially become insurance. Um, but there's an exercise here for companies with this change in definition where it brings talks about the present value basis, both in terms of preparing the assured event occurring to not occur, and also in terms of what the, uh, how you assess commercial substance. Without getting into the detail, it means we need to reconsider does that change in definition actually change our existing classifications? So that could mean that you've said, oh, everything, everything I write is investment classified and not even subject to IFRS 70. You might just want to reconsider, or that I have some products that uh, I have a mix of investment and insurance, and I might want to reconsider. Now, I think for most cases, if you're talking most non-life business and a lot of traditional protection life business, um, it's probably you know, very straightforward and you don't need to really get concerned about it, but maybe for some ones that are more borderline, doing an exercise just to see if that does that actually bite. And a related area, I won't go through this, I'll leave this for reference. Uh, unbundling was a concept as well that was, is under IFRS 4. Uh, the difference is that there was an option to apply unbundling on, under IFRS 4 that some companies availed of uh, in terms of splitting out investment versus insurance components of a single contract. 
So this is again mainly a, a more of a life issue than a non-life issue. But uh, the difference is where IFRS 4 said, here's where you should unbundle, here's where you shouldn't unbundle, and here's where you may choose to unbundle, IFRS 17 got rid of the last, and there's no longer an option. So if you've unbundled under IFRS 4, as a number of companies have, uh, you may you need to reassess, do I need to rebundle? So maybe you had a, a, an investment contract, a host investment contract that has rider benefits, but the rider benefits are closely related to the, uh, the host contract, and will, if you can't terminate one without the other, arguably that should be rebundled and all under IFRS 70. So that can be quite an impact. A number of uh, companies I work with have done that uh, to avoid having to worry, you know, say effectively we treat everything maybe as if they have a large investment portfolio, treat everything as investment contracts and have to say, well, our unbundled insurance element is immaterial and may even feel, oh, I'm out of scope prior to Check. So those are two existing areas. Um, the next area I want to talk about is something that's uh, quite specific to IFRS 17 in terms of the aggregation level or unit of account to use the IFRS 17 wording. Right there. So this is effectively, so how do we group our policies together uh, before we um, apply the measurement models that Joanne's going to talk about shortly? So the idea here is um, that IFRS 17 doesn't want us to group profitable and unprofitable or owner's contracts together. It wants us to separate them out and account for them differently. And no CSM or contractual service margin is part of that and saying, I want to recognize uh, the profit in line with uh, those homogenous group of contracts. So what we're meant to do is, first of all, we're meant to take a top-down approach and say, okay, what's it? I have, what portfolios do I have? Um, so the portfolio should be similar risks that are managed together. So maybe that's car insurance, maybe that's uh, an annuity portfolio. And so there's some work there to assess, first of all, okay, what portfolios do I have? For some companies, it could be, I've only got one portfolio, everything I write maybe is an investment or savings business. But then we need to split this between, uh, are the contracts at inception, owners, i.e. unprofitable, based on my information at inception, well, are they profitable with no significant risk of becoming owners, or in the other category, other profitable contracts? So there's an exercise to do there to assess, do I have, you know, how, how, how far, when I'm going back in time, or even just looking at new business, what have I written in the period? Uh, did I actually expect it to be onerous? And in, you have different approaches already in the market in terms of whether people are trying to take a principles-based approach, or I think the majority are saying, well, really, we have to just evidence this through numerical support and have maybe internal reporting, sensitivity, et cetera, to show that I'm actually writing uh, owner's contracts, non profitable et cetera. But even just having to split that, so one there's an assessment. Uh, once you do that assessment, you don't change it thereafter. But there's a significant piece of work there to assess that, especially when you have to do it uh, by cohort year, effectively. So the requirement is that you shouldn't have a group that spans more than one year, a group of contracts. So effectively, most companies are saying, well, that's our financial reporting year. So if you December year end, I look at 2013, 14, 15, 16 se separately, etc. But in each of those, I'll have my portfolios and I'll have my potentially up to three categories. So it's a, a major piece of work. It means that there's an awful lot more granular data. I'll come on to that shortly. Um, and it drives everything thereafter in terms of it impacts your, your p and results. There are some allowances. Because you might naturally think of something like um, uh, regulations around uh, gender neutral pricing. And there, is some, there are some clauses in IFRS 17 that allow for such things that you don't have to uh, unduly split out contracts. And uh, so you have to work through that case by case to see what applies, especially for writing maybe cross border business. So, what does all of that mean? To give you a little example, if you have 100 identical contracts and you have a probability that five of them will claim, you don't know which five, then you can treat that 100 contracts at inception as one group. You don't need to separate them out in terms of the profitability categorization. On the other hand, if you have another company that has 500 contracts, but you have information at inception that 200 identical, I, this is the homogenous risk group idea, 200 identical contracts are loss making, but the other 300 contracts, and those other 300 are considered also another homogenous risk group or identical, if those are um, profitable, then you end up with two groups. 
So you can see very quickly you can end up in a situation that you have lots of groups per cohort year and uh, that may not be the same every year. And then depending on how many portfolios you have, you have a lot of granularity. And this feeds through your measurement models and it feeds through your reporting and uh, your, your disclosures. So it's very important. So companies will need to do an assessment in terms of, okay, what level of aggregation unit of account applies for our business? It's going to have significant modeling impacts. When you're calculating your measurement model, you're meant to look, allocate down to those individual categories. Um, so you're calculating your bell anyway. You might say whether I calculate it at a single policy level or you know, add up all my policies, what difference does that make? Well, actually, it impacts your CSM. So those contract, those groupings directly impact what you're going to see in terms of either have I losses coming through on day one from owner's contracts versus profitable contracts and the release of that, those profits through the CSM over time. Okay, so that brings us on to measure models and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Niall. Um, so yeah, as Niall said, I'm going to focus primarily today on the measurement models under IFRS 17. Um, so there are three measurement approaches, the first one being the pre-allocation approach, uh, the building block approach, and the variable fee approach. Uh, so I'm going to go through each of the models in turn today and really just focus on the main points for each one. Um, so in general, the building block approach is your default approach. It's going to be used for the majority of your insurance contracts. Your premium allocation approach then is an optional simplification, uh, primarily used really for a short-term business. Uh, and then thirdly then, your variable fee approach. Um, this has to be used where you have insurance contracts with payments that vary with the returns of underlying assets. So really, you'd be looking at your unit link contracts or your with profits contracts. So starting with the building block approach then, um, so this is really the basis for measurement under IFRS 17, uh, and it's made up of four main blocks. So your first block is your expected future cash flows. Uh, so very similar to your best estimate cash flows under Solvency 2, um, they're probability weighted estimates, with the two main differences being, first of all, your contract boundaries, which we're going to come on to a little bit later, um, and your second difference then are the expenses that are actually allowable within these future cash flows. So under IFRS 17, your expenses actually have to be directly attributable to your portfolio of contracts, which means that under IFRS 17, the general overheads that you might have included within Psalm C2 will no longer be permitted. So the second block then is your time value of money. So discounting is obviously a concept that you're going to be very familiar with from Psalm C2, um, but I suppose the really key difference here is the fact that the discount rates are not prescribed under IFRS 17. Um, the third block then is your risk adjustment. So this is an entity-specific assessment of the uncertainty around your amount and timing of your future cash flows, uh, similar to your risk margin under SOMC2, but with a few kind of uh, key differences. So combining the first three blocks there gives you your fulfillment cash flows under IFRS 17. <clears throat> Block four then is your contractual service margin or your CSM. This is really the major innovation of IFRS 17, as those is the area that insurers wouldn't would be the least familiar with. Um, at initial inception, it essentially represents the expected uh, profit that you expect to earn on that contract. Uh, and that profit then is recognized over the coverage period of the contract. Uh, one of the key things to note about the CSM is that interest is, is accreted on the CSM using locked in discount rates. So at initial inception, you need to obviously identify the discount or the yield curve that you're going to use at that point and lock it in over the coverage period of that contract. So the measurement under IFRS 17 then is kind of underpinned by a number of key principles. Uh, the first one being the fact that you have to re-measure your fulfillment cash flows at each valuation date using current assumptions. The second one is, as Niall said, your contracts are grouped um, according to certain rules under IFRS 17. So first of all, taking your portfolio of contracts uh, and then subdividing them then further into profitability groups. Um, you can no longer recognize upfront your, your profit on day one. Now you have to make sure that you're recognizing your profit in line with uh, the service that you're actually providing. And the last one then really to notice is around your discount rates. So your discount rates need to be based on market data and they need to reflect the characteristics of your insurance contracts in terms of timing, currency and the liquidity characteristics of your cash flows. 
I suppose the first starting point when you're looking at your first block, which is your future cash flows, uh, you need to identify two points. The first point is when are you going to actually recognize the contract? And the last point is, well, up to what point should I project my cash flows up until? So starting with initial recognition then, so under IFRS 17, you recognize your insurance contracts at the earlier of the beginning of the coverage period, the date when the first pay payment is due from the policyholder, or when the group of contracts is known to be onerous. So if, you, if there's no contractual payment date, um, it's deemed to be the date when you first receive payment from the policyholder. So this definition is a little bit different to under Somsi 2. So under Somsi 2, you would recognize a contract at the beginning, at the earlier of the beginning of the coverage period and when you're first bound to the contract. This is one of the first key differences that we're seeing between Somsi 2 and IFRS 70. So the second point that you need to identify then is your contract boundary. So again, it's going to be a concept that you're pretty familiar with from Psalm C2, but there are a number of key differences. So this diagram here basically gives you an idea of the kind of questions you need to ask yourself to identify whether or not a contract boundary actually exists for each contract. So the first one is whether the policyholder is obliged to actually pay premiums. So if yes, uh, then there's no contract boundary. You see, you include the cash flow then within your measurement of the cash flows. Um, then you need to consider, do you have the practical ability to reprice the risks of this particular policyholder? Uh, if yes, then that does represent a contract boundary and you exclude your cash flow. Uh, then you consider, do you have the practical ability to reprice the portfolio of contracts to actually reflect your risks? And have you actually, when you price the contract, have you included risks beyond the, co the coverage period? So if you have included risks beyond the coverage period, then again, there's, there's no contract boundary there. So again, a very similar concept to Psalm C2, but you will actually need to do uh, an assessment to understand whether or not your contract boundaries will differ between Psalm C2 and IFRS 17. So once you've determined then your start point and your end point of your future cash flows, you then need to determine which cash flows you should actually include within your measurement. So just to give you a brief idea of a couple of cash flows you might include, so obviously your premium, your claims cash flows, um, as I said, for expenses, you need to make sure that they're directly attributable to your portfolio of contracts. Um, these could include costs of selling or underwriting your contracts um, and some types of overheads, such as uh, costs associated with claims software. Cash flows then that will be excluded will be any kind of expenses that are not directly attributable, any general overheads, um, and then any investment returns. This is something that Niall touched on earlier, uh, the fact that under IFRS 17, one of the key principles is that you need to separate out your investment results from your insurance results. So the second block then is your discount rates. Uh, so once you've determined your best estimate cash flows, you then need to reflect your time value of money. So as we said, the discount rates under IFRS 17 are not prescribed. Um, they're based on a principle-based approach and you can use two methods to derive your discount rate. Your first one is your top-down approach. So this essentially means you're going to start with the yield on a reference portfolio of assets and then adjust this yield for any characteristics that are not relevant to your insurance contracts. So for example, for expected credit losses or credit risk premiums um, and also I suppose for any duration mismatches that are there between your assets and your liabilities. The other approach then that you can use is the bottom-up approach. This is essentially starting from the, the opposite way around. So this time you're starting with your risk-free yield curve, which could be, of course, your EOPA risk-free yield curves. And then you're adding on an allowance then to reflect the illiquidity of your insurance contract. So block three then is your risk adjustment. So your risk adjustment, as I said, represents the uncertainty around the amount and timing of future cash flows. So really, I suppose this represents a difference between fulfilling um, liabilities, cash flows that are uncertain versus those that are fixed. I think the key thing to remember about the risk adjustment really is that it's entity specific rather than market consistent. So I suppose you need to ensure that you're reflecting the entity's risk appetite within your risk adjustment. Um, as well as the diversification of risks, both favourable and unfavourable, that the entity uh, faces. So the risk adjustment then is revalued at each valuation date uh, using current assumptions. 
and it's recognized then over the settlement period. So both the actual um, method to calculate the risk adjustment and the method by which you amortize the risk adjustment over the settlement period, neither of those are actually defined in the standards. They really are left up to the discretion of the entity itself. And I suppose, as Niall touched on earlier, one of the key questions that we continuously get asked is, can I use the SOMC2 risk margin as my risk adjustment under IFRS 17? And unfortunately, the answer is no, not without a, a number of adjustments. So I suppose if you are to use, say, a cost of capital approach to derive your IFRS 17 risk adjustment, um, there are a, a number of adjustments or things that you need to be aware of. So the first thing, I suppose, is you have a certain cost of capital and a confidence level that you need to use to measure your SOMC2 risk margin. So when you're coming up with your risk adjustment, you don't necessarily need to actually use the same parameters. You need to decide on your own parameters that are fully reflective of you know, your own entity's risk appetite. Um, the second thing then to consider is that your SOMC2 risk margin is actually, you know, it's looking over a one year time horizon, whereas for your IFRS 17 risk adjustment, it's looking over the lifetime of your cash flows, which obviously might necessarily be one year. And I suppose one of the key differences really then is the fact that your SOMC2 risk margin is on a net basis, whereas you require both a gross and a reinsurance risk adjustment under IFRS 17. So your final block then is your contractual service margin, your CSM. So as we said, um, at initial inception, this is essentially equal and opposite to the sum of your fulfillment cash flows and it represents the profit that you expect to earn on that contract over the coverage period. The CSM is recognized over the coverage period based on metrics known as coverage units, which essentially represent the amount of coverage that you expect to provide within each uh, quarter or each valuation period. A couple of key things to note about the CSM. The first thing is that it's measured at the group level or your unit of account. Um, second of all, then, uh, discount rates. So Interest is accreted on your CSM using locked in discount rates rather than current. So when you're measuring your fulfillment cash flows, as I said, you're going to update your assumptions at each valuation period. But the one exception to this is when you're accreting interest on your CSM. So interest is accreted using locked in discount rates, and these discount rates are locked in at initial inception of each contract. This obviously represents a huge storage requirement for entities because they need to actually store and move on these yield curves for each valuation date and for each unit of account over the coverage period. The next thing to note then is that the CSM has to be positive. So if you end up with a negative CSM, you need to actually recognize that a negative CSM as a loss immediately in your profit and loss account. And you also need to set up a loss component. This loss component, very similar to your CSM, will need to be tracked then over your coverage period and adjusted then for changes in any assumptions. Um, so we're just going to skip to this slide. So this slide basically illustrates how you might actually go about calculating your CSM. So starting at the left hand side there, you have your opening balance. Um, this is going to be increased then or adjusted for any new contracts added to that unit of account. Uh, then as we mentioned, you accrete interest on your CSM using locked in yield curves. Your CSM is then adjusted for any changes in value of demographic assumptions. So any changes in value of financial assumptions will go straight through your profit and loss account rather than through your CSM. Uh, the CSM then is a monetary amount, so if there's any kind of impacts of FX changes, you also need to reflect this within your CSM. So for example, if you have a number of contracts within your unit of account with different kind of original treaty currencies, this could be a, an area where you need to actually, in order to aggregate up to the unit of account level, you need to convert to the same currency and that currency impact will go through your CSM. The final adjustment then is around the amortization of your CSM. So as I said, your CSM is amortized over the coverage period based on coverage units. Um, and I suppose these coverage units, again, just to note, the metric that you use for these coverage units is not defined. Um, so it could be, say, for example, your sum assured or your premiums, and it is likely to differ between contracts within your particular company. So I've talked a lot then about measurement, I suppose, at initial recognition. Um, but if you move on then to subsequent measurement, so as I said, at each future valuation date, you're going to revalue your fulfillment cash flows using current assumptions. And any changes in assumptions relating to past exposure will go straight to your profit and loss account, 
whereas any changes relating to future, future exposure will pretty much go through your CSM, bar any changes in financial assumptions, which will go through your profit and loss or your, your OCI. So the second measurement model then is the variable fee approach. So as I said, you have to use this if you have contracts um, with payments that vary with the return of underlying assets. So unit length and width profits are the two most obvious examples here. So the variable fee approach essentially treats returns on the assets as part of the fee that you've charged the policyholder for providing services. And there's two key differences between your variable fee approach and your building block approach. The first one is that your CSM is actually adjusted for financial assumptions, which differs from the building block approach, where it's not. And the second one is that the CSM is actually accreted using current interest rates rather than your locked in yield curve as per the building block approach. But the main benefit then of using the variable fee approach is that it eliminates any artificial volatility within your profit and loss account by allowing you to actually adjust your CSM for these changes in financial assumptions. So the third measurement model then is the premium allocation approach. Uh, so this is an optional simplification um, that you can use once certain eligibility criteria are met. And we're going to touch on those eligibility criteria a little bit later on. The first thing to note about the premium allocation approach is that it can only be used to measure your liability for remaining coverage. So your liability for incurred claims, regardless of what model you use, still has to be measured using the building block approach. So I suppose just to explain then the difference between your, your liability for incurred claims, your liability for remaining coverage, your liability for remaining coverage relates to future exposure, whereas your liability for incurred claims relates to past exposure. And I suppose the key benefit then of using the building block approach is the fact that you don't actually have to explicitly calculate and allow for your contractual service margin. So in particular, non-life insurers will be able to leverage the existing systems and processes that they have in place for calculating their unearned premium reserves. So this slide then kind of gives you an idea of what the eligibility criteria are for the premium allocation approach. So this, I suppose, is the first step for insurers in deciding, well, how much work needs to be done to demonstrate this eligibility, and also to help them identify areas of the book, especially for non-life insurers, where they actually won't be able to apply this premium allocation approach model. So if the coverage period is one year or less, then the contract will automatically fall under the premium allocation approach. This means the majority of non-life contracts will fall under this model and some kind of short-term life insurance contracts as well. So if your coverage period is greater than one year, it might still be possible to use the premium allocation approach if you can show that it provides a reasonable approximation to the building block approach. So this would not be met if at initial inception you would expect significant variability in your future cash flows. So things that might increase this variability will be the length of the coverage period and also if you have any embedded derivatives within your insurance contract. But I suppose the key impact for insurers is that they will actually have to set up processes in order to demonstrate this eligibility and I suppose what really will be expected from auditors is uh, a comparison between your building block approach and your premium allocation approach to see the impact on your release on profit and your, your impact on your liability for, for remaining coverage over time. So this gives you a, an idea really of how, how you might look at the premium allocation approach and building block approach and how they might vary over time. So if we start on the left hand side there, um, we can see at initial inception that the two models produce the total liability is the same under both models. So this essentially tells you that the premium allocation approach is a proxy for the building block approach. So moving then to during the coverage period, we can see that the liability is now broken into liability for remaining coverage and liability for incurred claims. So again, your liability for remaining coverage, the total liability is the same, but the composition of the blocks again differs. The liability for incurred claims, so as we said, we have to use the building block approach for the liability for incurred claims, regardless of which model you use. So you can see here that both the total is the same and also the composition of the block. Then if we move to the end of the coverage period, we can see that we no longer have a liability for remaining coverage and we're just left with our liability for incurred claims. So again, your liability for incurred claims is measured using the building block approach under both models. And you can also see here that we are left with the risk adjustment at the end of the coverage period. 
This is because, as we said, your risk adjustment is recognised over your settlement period, as opposed to your CSM, which is recognised over your coverage period. Okay, so the other topic I'm going to touch on a bit is how reinsurance is treated under IFRS 17. So there are a couple of modifications to the core requirements uh, when you're looking at reinsurance contracts. So the first one is the measurement model that you can actually use. So under IFRS 17, you can't use the variable fee approach for either inwards or outwards reinsurance contracts. You can use the premium allocation approach, but I suppose the thing to remember if you're outwards reinsurance contracts is that eligibility is determined separately from your underlying insurance contracts. So I suppose these two components combined means that you could end up with a situation where your underlying insurance contract is measured under one model and your outwards reinsurance contract is measured under another, just an obvious mismatch between the two. So really that's the only difference um, in the treatment of inwards reinsurance contracts under IFRS 17. Bar the measurement model, it's treated the exact same way as your underlying insurance contracts. But there are a number of additional modifications for your outwards reinsurance contracts. So the first one is that you have to use assumptions that are consistent with your underlying insurance contracts, but these cash flows do need to be adjusted to reflect the credit risk of the reinsurer. And I suppose one of the major dif differences is in terms of recognition criteria. We know that for our underlying insurance contracts, we're going to recognise it at the earlier of the beginning of the coverage period, the date when the first payment is due, or when you're actually bound, or when you know that the, the contract is over us. So for your outwards reinsurance contracts, on the other hand, if you have proportional reinsurance, it, it's recognised at the later of the beginning of the coverage period of the group of reinsurance contracts, or at initial recognition of the underlying insurance contracts. So in all other cases, so if you're excess of loss, you're a stop loss reinsurance, is always recognised at the beginning of the coverage period of the group of reinsurance contracts. So again, this is another area where there could be a potential mismatch between your underlying insurance contract and your outwards reinsurance contract, because they could be recognised at different points in time. So the aggregation requirements for outwards reinsurance contracts are very similar to, as Niall described earlier on, um, but the one key difference is that there's no concept of owner's contracts under IFRS 17. So instead of being divided into groups according to the profitability, it's now divided into groups according to whether they produce a net cost or a net gain at initial recognition. So under the so for underlying insurance contracts, your CSM, as I said, can only be positive, but for uh, outwards reinsurance contracts, it can either be positive or negative. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Niall, who's going to move on to transition. Thanks, John. We're on the home stretch. Uh, so transition, we I mentioned at the start. So this is saying, okay, when I'm writing contracts over an extended period, I have to apply a standard retrospectively. How do I go about doing that? So the first the starting point is that everybody should do a full retrospective application and apply all of that good stuff that we touched on um, right back to whatever many past years of business you have. Uh, which is obviously very demanding and not everybody will have the historical data uh, and other you know, assumption data and so on uh, to do so. So the standard says, well, okay, if it's impractical and it gives a few little criteria there on the right, um, so if, you, if you can't really do it, uh, then you have a choice between saying, I'll use the modified retrospective or I'll measure fair value. So ultimately what you're trying to do is saying, what, is, you know, what are the values I'm putting on my liabilities uh, on one January 2021, for example. So if, you can't, if you're in that second category saying, okay, well, I don't have maybe historical assumption data, or maybe I have my historical assumption data and my policyholder data for cohort 1999, um, but actually I can't even model it because I no longer have models that use that structure of data. How do I go about doing that? So maybe that might be a case where you say it's impractical, but you do need to have the evidence to say, I tried. And clearly when you talk to more recent cohorts, you're saying, well, actually, uh, I'm looking at 2018 data and you're at 2021, it'd be not so favourable to be saying I can't go and model that using the full retrospective application. So what companies are looking at is saying, okay, I'll do an assessment, I'll go back, look at my different cohorts and look how, at how material they are as well when I get to actually first time adoption. In case if you have some closed blocks, they may be running off, so they may not be as material when you get to actual uh, adoption date, whether that's delayed or not. 
and then saying, okay, well, how, maybe I'll use full retrospective for the most recent cohorts. Modified retrospective is basically a simplified version. It's not that simplified. It's still quite demanding. But some companies are looking at that for saying, I'll use that for maybe my uh, slightly older cohorts, and then maybe for my very older cohorts, where I just can't do it, I'll use the fair value. There's lots of judgment in this. Uh, there's scope to argue different ways and look at what the impacts might be and take that on board and choosing what approach you go for, uh, because it does have a big impact. Um, fair value, for example, you could end up with a CSM value you don't like. So it may seem like, oh, that's a straightforward approach, but you may not like the answer. So there is a driver to try and use some of the other approaches, and it's, worth, uh, it's an exercise by itself. So moving on to uh, presentation and disclosure, this is also an area of major change. In the balance sheet, uh, we obviously don't have too many line items that are in scope of actuarial usually. Uh, we have our insurance contract liabilities, but actually now uh, we need to split out assets, insurance contract assets and liabilities. So your owner's contracts from your profitable contracts are presented separately. Similarly for your reinsurance assets and liabilities. And also there's no separate line items anymore for insurance payables, receivables, policy loans, and so on. They'll be all within your insurance contract line items. So all of that means there's a bit more transparency, uh, but also there's a bit more coordination required between accounting and actuarial. And of course, that's even without mentioning knock-on impacts. When we think of something like deferred tax assets in the balance sheet, um, those are dependent on future profits. Our profit profile is going to be different under IFR 17, where you have insurance classified contracts. Uh, and therefore, maybe the, the value of that may change. And that's even before you get to maybe something to then saying, well, maybe my LACDT might change because that's based on IFR 17 profits. Well, or will be in due course. So the balance sheet is a, is a certain amount of change, but the income statement is, is a whole new ballgame. Uh, so what we're really trying, what IFR 17 is trying to do here is align the presentation of revenue with other industries. So much more on a, a revenue earned basis rather than showing premium items as we have had to date. So uh, I won't go through too much in detail here other than say, there's a, I think the best example is over on the next slide is just to show how different it is. There, it's a very different PL. It's a big exercise by itself. There's going to be a new chart of accounts, a new ledger required for that. Then you need to coordinate that with all your SOMP2 journal entries and your uh, other accounting journal entries. So there's big system implications of this. And obviously you want this to be part of an automated, controlled process, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, it's a work stream by itself. And just to go back to, you know, the insurance contract revenue, so that replaces premium. No longer do we have gross written premiums, earned premiums, et cetera, on our PL. Uh, now it's calculated as some of those components there, expected changes in cash flows from claims and expenses, change in risk adjustment, amortization of CSM, amortization of acquisition costs. So very, very different. And of course, that's before we get to disclosures, and disclosures are more detailed. Nothing ever gets lighter, it seems. So disclosures are more detailed, uh, and I'll come on to that in another slide. Um, so there's both more disclosures, and the areas that we already disclose, there's more detail around those areas. So without going through this, you may not be able to read the small print anyway. Uh, on the left is an example of an, uh, an IFRS 4 PL, or Statement of Comprehensive Income, as it's uh, called under IFRS 17. And on the right is an example of what we might see under IFRS 17. So different in size to start with, uh, but also different in components. Uh, and it's going to have a different uh, bottom line number. And of course, if you elect to have other comprehensive income, you'll have that other, uh, and you'll have that as well. So very different was just the message I wanted to pass there. On disclosures, I just highlight in this slide, the black parts there, the black font, is the areas that are subject to current disclosure requirements. So not new headings, they're already under IFRS 4 and so on, but now we've got more detail around those. But what really bites is when we look at the red items, the red font there, and we can see that for the balance sheet, there are numerous detailed reconciliations uh, of things like uh, our best asset liability component, our risk adjustment, our CSM, or using PAA, and how that moves over the period uh, by blocks of business. So that's a lot of extra detail to be publicly disclosing and also to calculate. Uh, and then we have air, uh, more information around judgments, so yield curves. Uh, when you look at your risk adjustment, you can use different approaches. You could use a cost of capital approach, bar approach, etc. But you have to disclose a confidence level uh, for that risk adjustment. And there's other requirements. So a lot of work to be done there. But 
And we've had a bit of a high level tour there of some of the areas that are far from exhaustive, but I really want to just highlight that it's, it's a wide ranging impact. Hybrid 17 will impact beyond. And do with flavor, so it'll have business considerations. Obviously, our, a lot of Irish market is foreign owned, and when we look to our groups, maybe for uh, what they're doing with their investors and analysts, uh, educating them, looking at maybe non GAAP measures. So, supplementary information at the moment may be updated to reflect well. IFRS 17 is, yes, meant to make everything more comparable, but is it what uh, groups really want to be communicating to investors and how they bring that together with investment contracts as, as, as continue to happen? Changes in timing and the volatility of profit emergence and uh, what that means on dividends. And um, potential changes or at least considerations uh, for product design. So I mentioned the unbundling example earlier, uh, but clearly, you know, IFRS profit can be a factor of many uh, in product design. When we look at profit, uh, when we look at planning and forecasting, clearly different profit uh, recognition profile will, will have an impact. And of course, it's a factor in M&A. Lots of operational considerations, lots more data, as we saw from the unit account and the different models that we're going to have and all those disclosures. So that poses challenges in terms of developing new processes and governance around that and making sure that we get it as automated as possible and fitting within working day timetables, especially when we think of maybe very short group reporting timelines. <coughs> and all of that has an impact on IT processes, people. And particularly for IT, as Joanne talked about, you know, the CSM, that's a whole new concept that needs generally an, a new solution, but also something to capture all that data. So there's choices out there, lots of different service uh, uh, solution offerings out there in the market. So it's a case by case of what's fit for purpose for you, what is your group doing, and um, can you leverage that? But ultimately, there's going to be new actuarial calculations, greater interaction between accounting and actuarial in calculating the CSM, it requires both actuarial and, and uh, accounting feeds. And all of that needs to go through the ledger and, then, and in a short time frame, potentially, depending on your reporting timelines. And of course, you may have lots of third parties then to engage with to achieve that. So lots of wide ranging impacts. And some, you know, ultimately all of this changes the PL, what's that mean for KPIs, remuneration policies, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very simplistic example of some steps you might follow uh, to get to the adoption date get through your implementation plan. Clearly, if you haven't already started, get organized. Uh, do the normal good, over, good overhead project stuff, silver projects, do your impact assessment, gap analysis, where are the biggest gaps, where are the priority areas for your particular business? Um, make sure you're gathering data now, if nothing else. Uh, and get a project plan in place. So if there is a delay, don't plan for a delay, but at least if there is a delay, then you can update your plan accordingly. And ultimately, many groups have already quite detailed plans that apply to their business units or subsidiaries, and that uh, those will have dry run comparatives, maybe um, not only for annual reporting, mid-year, quarterly, et cetera, and you'll need to be ready to feed into those. So fundamental change. And really to wrap up, so yes, it's effective from 1 January, prior comparisons mentioned, delay, but it's a very complex standard, and there are accounting policy options. We haven't touched on everything today by any means. There are lots of interpretations. When you start getting into a project and you get into the detail, uh, there's lots of specific things that just aren't clear from the guidance. And market practice is, is not really, it's not so much evolving as it's developing. And there's lots of areas that are subject to base. Companies are looking at potentially very significantly different approaches. But you know, it's early stages yet, and they have, you know, there's, the challenge to those approaches remains to be seen. Lots of working assumptions are required. Um, and of course, if you have a, an insurance group parent, then you look to leverage their guidance, but you may need to make other working assumptions where your business is different to the group, or maybe they haven't made those decisions yet. As Joanne noted, uh, reinsurance is one area where there be, can be accounting mismatches, and there can be others. The scope to leverage SOMC2. Uh, so for example, your, yes, your risk margin under SOMC2 can be very helpful, but of course, that's for, if you're a life company, that's, all, that's for all of your business, you need to split it out for your insurance classified business only. You'll maybe, if you're, that's assuming you're using a cost of capital approach anyway. Uh, and then you'll need to look at different diversification uh, impacts and different cost of capital, perhaps, and of course, aligning that with parent reporting. But ultimately, that's just one area. So, yes, try, and, try to leverage SOMC2, uh, try to align your processes. Companies are looking sometimes at this at IFRS 17 as part of wider finance, actual transformational change. Uh, usually, those projects are on the go. 
but are you looking for minimum compliance? Are you looking for something compliance plus? At this stage, uh, you haven't started and there isn't a delay, you're probably in the former category. Um, so really it's not just actuarial uh, and accounting, it's commercial impacts, systems, processes, KPIs, products, reinsurance, tax, lots of areas. Our key message today is don't delay, uh, but hopefully we will have some more training sessions, educational sessions that uh, we can get into some more of the juicy fun bits of this. And uh, well, let's open to any questions. Thank you.